hope we're ready to hear God's word. I was preaching to you various months ago, and we had all sorts of a good time with that story of the general, right, who contracted leprosy uh, in the Old Testament scripture. And today we're going to use another story. And I want you to join me this morning in the reading of the text for today. It comes from, if you have the Bible with you, you can look at it. If not, I think it will appear up in the screen right above me and to the sides of us. And I want us to look at these verses that will be the text for today's sermon. It comes from Matthew 9 again, verses 20 to 22. And when I read it, I think you will realize that it is a familiar story to us. It reads the following way. Then suddenly, a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she said to herself, if I can touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus then turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And instantly, the woman was made well. Amen. How many can say glory to God? Glory to God. Glory to God. Now, before I begin my sermon, as part of it, I would say, I would like to ask you to repeat a few words after me in a loud voice. Okay, are you ready? Are you ready? Yes. Remember, remember, it's going to get all sorts of noisy in here, so you better get used to it. Right? I want you to say these words aloud, repeating after me. A little bit of God can go a long way. Can you say that? A little bit of God can go a long way. Let's do it one more time. That's right. Well, all right. If you don't remember anything else in my sermon, but you remember those words, you will be in good shape. That is both the title of my sermon and its main point. So if it's all you remember, you will have done well for yourself. So here we go. And I'll start with a story of my own. Earlier this year, I found myself teaching a course on the historical Jesus at the university where I teach. And as part of the course, I had students read many different kinds of writings. We read books on archaeology that spoke about artifacts found from the time of Jesus and the place where Jesus lived. We read ancient Jewish and Christian texts that illuminate what Jesus' world must have been like. We read modern history books that deal with a variety of aspects of the world in which Jesus lived. And we, of course, read the New Testament Gospels. We did all of this hoping to arrive at a better picture of the context of Jesus' life and ministry, and therefore, hopefully, at a better picture of who Jesus was and what he did. Now, because my practice is to read everything I assign my students, dump me, right? <laughs> I assign too much stuff and then I end up reading too much stuff. But because I do that, I read all of these books and articles along with them. And this means that I found myself reading the Gospels again. I had read the Gospels in their entirety 
various times before, of course. After all, I grew up in a church that the Bible was central for it. But there is something beautiful about reading the scriptures repeatedly. When you do this, you often find that you tend to discover new things in the stories of the Bible. I don't know if it happens with you, but it happens with me. Or you may find that you stumble upon new details in these stories. Or you find that things you previously knew grab your attention in a different way. And they end up carrying new meaning and speaking to you in fresh ways. I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but it's happened to me various times, and it happened to me this time again. And that's exactly what happened to me when I read this story of the woman with the issue of blood again. But what caught my attention this time are four simple words that the Gospel of Matthew uses when telling the story of this woman. If I can only are the four words I am referring to. And I have to admit this morning that I not only became fascinated with these four words, but that I even obsessed over them for a little while. My wife knows this very well, and those of you who know me very well know that Ben has a little OCD in him, all right? I can obsess over things, but basically in this case, I wondered why the gospel writer felt compelled to include these words in his story. After all, I don't know if you noticed, but the story could have been told without these four words being included. Matthew could have told the story without these words, and the story would have made perfect sense. But instead, Matthew has this woman thinking to herself and saying to herself, if I can only touch the fringe of his cloak, I will be made well. And it was the first four words of that statement that piqued my interest and curiosity. If I can only. Why the importance of these four words, I thought to myself. Why include them? when the story could be told without them, and very easily. What was the gospel writer trying to communicate to us when he decided to include these four simple words in the story? Why? Why? What? I asked myself. And in my search for some answers, I turned to Bible commentaries and Bible encyclopedias. And because of my OCD, I even got some of my colleagues involved in my homework. Right? And so I went to someone who teaches New Testament. And I went to someone who teaches early Christian history. And I asked them, can you find these four words in the early versions and translations of the New Testament? After a while... Both of them got back to me and said, sure enough, they or their equivalent do appear in the earliest translations of the Bible. And since then, I have become more convinced, therefore, that these four words are important to understanding one of the main points of this biblical story. I want to share that point with you today. But before I do so, I want first to reconstruct the story of the woman while sharing some details about it that may make it even more interesting and more memorable for you. That's my hope at least. So let's give this a try. Now I'm going to begin with the observation that the story of the woman with the issue of blood is told in three of the four Gospels we have in our Bible. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. 
tell the story. And this tells us that the early Christian communities considered it a significant story in the life of Jesus and considered it a story worth retelling. So that's an important observation. I also find it very interesting that Christians of the second century felt that this heroic woman of faith should not remain nameless. And so they gave her a name. They called her Veronica. In time, Veronica even became a saint, Saint Veronica in the Catholic tradition. Now you probably have noticed that the biblical story does, doesn't provide the name of this woman. It simply refers to her as a woman who had been suffering from a hemorrhage problem. But the woman remains nameless. And this is simply because in the time of Jesus, the culture was highly patriarchal and highly sexist, and women therefore weren't granted the same honor or status as men were. For that reason, you will find that their names are not always mentioned in the biblical stories. In fact, there are many stories in which the women remain nameless. And that's the case in this story. But I love it that early Christians felt it was a shame that this woman of great faith had remained nameless in the biblical text. And they felt that she should be given a name. Now, I think this admirable, tenacious woman of great faith is definitely deserving of a name. And so in the spirit of honoring this woman, and in the spirit of these early Christians, I too will take to calling her Veronica today. So let me tell you some things about Veronica. Get used to that name. The Gospels tell us that Veronica had been suffering from a debilitating hemorrhage problem for 12 years. Historically, scholars of the Bible have tended to believe that the woman suffered from an unceasing menstruation or an ongoing menstrual cycle, which meant that she had to deal with a problem of continual bleeding for 12 years. The Gospels of Mark and Luke add that Veronica had spent all that she had looking for a cure, probably consulting folk healers and religious figures who were known to have healing powers. You see, at the time, there was no Mass General. There was no Boston Medical Center, nothing of that sort. But there were folk healers and there were religious healers who were he he figures who were known to have healing powers. But instead of getting better, she had grown worse, even though she had spent all her money consulting these kinds of people. Now, this little detail about her having spent all that she had is significant because it tells us that Veronica may have been a widow. I don't know if you knew that. In biblical times, it was extremely rare for common women to own property and to possess large amounts of money. And those who did often inherited their property or money if their husband died and left them some sort of property or money. The gospel story doesn't mention the name of a husband. And one possible reason why is that he may have died. The gospel story also doesn't mention any children. So it is possible that Veronica didn't have any. The picture one gets, therefore, is of a woman who may have been touched by tragedy earlier in her life through the loss of her husband. She also doesn't appear to have children. So with regards to immediate family then, it seems that Veronica was alone in the world and without the kind of safety net 
that having a husband and children could provide for a woman in the first century. So it is already a tough situation that Veronica has to deal with. And as if that were not enough, she is touched by tragedy yet again. Through a debilitating and stigmatizing disease that would see her lose all that she owned looking for a cure. And the illness that she came down with was especially cruel, with grave consequences, physically and socially. Physically speaking, we must imagine a woman who was anemic, weak, and who could probably hardly walk because of the constant loss of blood from her body. People who lose blood also consistently have to deal with, the, with dehydration and with fevers as their bodies react defensively to the consistent loss of blood. At the same time, we must keep in mind that people who deal with such blood conditions as hemophilia, for instance, or hemorrhage, have to deal with the constant fear of dying at any moment if their blood loss becomes severe enough. And this was during a time when blood banks and getting blood transfusions were not an option. You get the picture here, right? But I'm gonna to continue to draw it further out. On top of this, I want us to think about the discomfort, the inconvenience, and the possible embarrassment that Veronica had to live with for 12 years. Veronica's life was most likely a constant routine of washing and drying rags to catch and reduce the flow of her blood. It was a constant routine, most likely, of washing and drying clothes to clear them of any stains that may have been left on them. Furthermore, her condition may have omitted odor. So most likely, she had to deal with the possibility of embarrassment constantly, either because of possible staining of her clothes or because of odor emitting from her body. The point here is not an easy thing. It's a difficult situation that Veronica finds herself in. There is something else I want us to consider. It is the social and religious isolation Veronica would have had to deal with every single day of her life during those 12 long years of illness. What we have to understand here is that because of her continual bleeding, Veronica would have been regarded in Jewish law as ceremoniously unclean. According to Jewish law and practice in antiquity, a woman who experienced a discharge of blood for many days and beyond the normal time frame of a usual menstruation could be considered impure or unclean. We can read about this if you want in Leviticus chapter 15, verses 25 to 27, and you will see this Jewish law there. And, and the other thing is that any person who came into contact with her would have also been considered impure and unclean. And what this means is that because of her constant bleeding, Veronica most likely lived in a continuous state of uncleanness, which would have brought upon her social and religious isolation. Her condition would have excluded her from worship in the Jerusalem temple, for instance. It would have excluded her from the village synagogues. And it would have excluded her from most forms of community life. So Veronica's life, we have to imagine, was a life of isolation and loneliness. Pobre Veronica, no? Pobrecita. 
pero no hasta, pero la pobrecita va a cambiar la cosa pronto. This was Veronica's difficult situation. And I hope that by now you know enough about her situation, enough about the picture, to be moved anytime and every time we sing that song that we sing around here sometimes about the woman with the issue of blood. You know, we've sang that song here. I hope that every time we sing that song from here on forth, you are moved to sympathy for this woman. The level of her suffering should move us. I imagine Veronica's life as one without hugs from friends, children, and parents. I imagine her life as lacking normal human contact, as devoid of marital rights with its meaningful duties and privileges. I imagine her life as full of toil because of the need to constantly wash everything. She is poor and without income, not only because she has spent all her money seeking a cure, but also because her condition made her unemployable. And because she was left poor and without income, it is likely that she could not afford to eat nourishing food to compensate for her loss of strength due to her hemorrhage problem. All of these factors lead to this one reasonable conclusion. Veronica was a lonely, isolated, impoverished, ill, anemic, weakened woman who was probably dying by this point and was desperate after 12 long years of struggle with this blood disorder. Pobre, pobre Veronica. But, 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 she wasn't without hope. She wasn't without hope. And she wasn't without hope for three simple reasons. She was a strong-willed woman of faith, who was about to have an encounter with Jesus, who is the healer of healers. Now, as you might imagine, things are going to start looking up for Veronica in this sermon now. And that is what some determination, some faith, and an encounter with Jesus can do for you. But before we move on to the happy and inspirational part of the sermon, before we move on to the Hollywood ending of the story, I want to highlight Veronica's amazing tenacity and faith. We should note that Veronica could have stayed home when Jesus was passing through her town. She had many reasons to be discouraged and depressed. She had been sick for 12 long years. She had spent all her money looking for a cure and was no better for it. She had tried all sorts of different things to get better, but again, nothing had worked. She probably felt weak and tired all of the time. So the thought of having to fight through the crowds to get to Jesus might have seemed all sorts of overwhelming to her. Plus, there was not only the threat of embarrassment at being seen with bloodstains on her clothing, but even the threat of being stoned to death for putting those around her at risk of being declared impure or unclean if she came into contact with them. But the truth is that she had no one who could advocate for her. No one who could do her the favor of going to Jesus with a message of supplication. She was alone and didn't have influential advocates who could go to Jesus on her behalf to ask either for his visit or for his prayer 
from far away. You may remember that in some biblical stories, Jesus prayed for people from far away and they became cured. But in this case, Veronica has no one she can send to Jesus. She wasn't able to ask the Jewish elders to go to Jesus on her behalf. She wasn't a ruler, a centurion, or a leader of a synagogue who could get people to do things for her. So yes, Veronica had plenty of reasons to feel sorry for herself and to wallow in pity and to remain at home feeling helpless and defeated. But despite all this, she had not lost her fighting spirit. She had not lost her sense of hope. She had not lost her faith in God. And that can make all the difference in one's life. How many of you can say amen? amen. How many of you can say amen? amen. Do you believe that? Amen. All right. Well, let's see what it did for Veronica. And then we'll see what it can do for you. Veronica knew that if she wanted a chance at a miracle, she was going to have to get her weakened body to where Jesus was. She was going to have to overcome her fear of embarrassment, her fear of being recognized, her fear of possibly being stoned to death if she was discovered. She was going to have to muster every remaining ounce of energy in her body and in her mind to press through the crowds once she got to where Jesus was. And this is exactly what Veronica did. She overcame all of these inner and outer barriers and made her way to Jesus, believing that the opportunity for a miracle lied within her reach. Lied within her reach. Lied within her reach. It seems to me that Veronica had heard of the miracles of healing that Jesus had performed before. She had probably heard that on one occasion, Jesus had commanded an evil spirit to leave a man and that it did. She probably had heard that on another occasion, Jesus had healed Simon's mother-in-law's mother simply by holding her hand. She probably had heard that on another occasion, Jesus had told a paralytic to take up his mat and walk home. And that not only had this man been able to walk back home on his own power, but that he was able to walk back home having been forgiven of his sins as well. Veronica must have heard that on another occasion, Jesus had ordered the legion of demons in a man to leave him, and they did. She may have heard that Jesus had visited the tomb of Lazarus and had raised him from the dead. And she may have heard that on yet another occasion, Jesus had healed a blind man by putting some mud in his eyes and then clearing it off. So Veronica thought to herself, why not me? Why not me? If all of these others could be healed by Jesus, why not me? Can you say that with me? Why not me? That's what Veronica thought to herself. But the level of Veronica's faith is quite amazing and admirable. And I want to highlight Highlight it just a little bit further. I still have some time left here. Let's see what happens here because you put the mic in the hands of a former Pentecostal. <laughs> As my Dominican friends might say, Eta tipa eta pasa. <laughs> this woman is just amazing. I find it interesting that Veronica was convinced that if she could only manage to touch the hem of Jesus' garment, she would be healed. She was convinced 
that all she needed to do was touch the edge of Jesus' clothing to be healed. Not even the whole suit. Just the hem would be enough. If I can only touch his cloak, I will be made well, she says to herself. And this brings me to the main point I want to stress here. Remember I told you that I had a main point? Here it is. I just wanted to make you wait for it a little bit. The reason why the gospel writer, Matthew, included the four simple words, if I can only, in his story, is because he wants us to know that the most minuscule encounter, the most minuscule contact with God can produce great results. All we need is a small encounter with God. All we need is some kind of small contact with God. All we need is a small touch by God to be changed evermore. That is the faith that we need to have. And that was Veronica's faith. That was the kind of faith she had. And look what it did for her. The gospel story says that Veronica got up, left her home, and made her way to where Jesus was. She probably thought to herself, I don't care that I've tried everything and nothing has worked thus far. I don't care. I don't care that it has been 12 years of suffering with this disease and that I've grown worse no matter what I've tried. I don't care. I don't care that getting to Jesus and making my way through the crowd is going to be challenging and risky. I don't care. I don't care because I believe that this encounter, I believe this encounter will be different. I don't care because I believe this time things will be different. I don't care because I believe this time it will be the very embodiment of God's presence that I will be encountering. And because of this, she thought, I will be made well. Admirable, isn't it? Admirable, isn't she? And then Veronica outdid herself, convincing herself that all she needed to do when she got to Jesus was touch the border of his cloak and that the power of God that was in and through Jesus would enter into her body and heal her from the inside out. So I imagine that Veronica disguised herself in order not to be recognized by her neighbors she probably put on many layers of clothing to cover herself in her condition. And then she expended every ounce of energy remaining, uh, remaining in her frail body to get to Jesus. And then to fight through the crowd to get at Jesus. And when she arrived, she pressed through the crowd and then probably falling to the ground, as you see right up there, she approached Jesus, reached out, and touched the edge of his cloak, and she was instantly healed, says the scripture. <laughs> Veronica fought the good fight of faith. She kept her focus on Jesus and demonstrated her faith in Jesus through her determination to touch him. Now, I want to emphasize that I like that Veronica didn't allow herself to think that she had to plan and to carry out some elaborate grand scheme to be healed by Jesus. She didn't allow herself to think that she needed to throw herself at Jesus' feet and beg for his mercy and prayer. She didn't allow herself to think 
that she needed to scream at the top of her lungs to get Jesus' attention in order to ask for his prayer. She didn't allow herself to think that she needed to persuade Jesus to come to her house for a visit. She didn't allow herself to think that she needed to come down from some roof on some sort of wire to come face to face with Jesus. She didn't allow herself to think that she had to squeeze Jesus in a bear hug to partake of his healing powers. No! If I can only, if I can only, if I can only, can you say it with me? If I can only, if I can only, she said, if I can only touch the border of his cloak, I will be made well. And here is something to consider, and I'm coming to my conclusion soon. If Veronica had tried to accomplish these more difficult things, she may have failed at them. It is possible she may not have been able to do these other things. And she may not have attained her healing. If she had allowed herself to think that only a grand gesture would work, she may have impeded herself from attaining her healing. But Veronica believed that a simple touch of Jesus' clothes would be enough to make her well. And there is a big lesson in this for us. Sometimes we think that to get God's attention, that to gain God's favor, that to receive God's blessing, we need to carry out some sort of huge project or some, some sort of huge agenda when sometimes a simple deed might be enough. Sometimes we think we need to pray for long hours at a time. That we need to live perfect or almost perfect lives. That we need to be like saints or angels walking on the face of this earth. And sometimes we even put such enormous pressure on ourselves to try and comply with such impossible and weighty moral ideals and expectations that all we do is set ourselves up for failure. We set ourselves up for feelings of guilt and resentment, and we just make ourselves miserable in the process. Now, I want to be clear. I don't want Pastor Miranda to call my attention on this. <laughs> so I want to make something clear here. I want to be clear that all of these strivings all the things I have just mentioned have their merit and their place. But we must always remember that God's grace surpasses our merit. We must always remember that God's love and compassion surpasses our virtue. We must always remember that God's power surpasses our comprehension and even imagination. And we must always remember that God's blessing surpasses our achievement. We need to learn, in other words, that simple encounters with God, that brief moments with God, that a little bit of God, in other words, can go a long way. And that is the meaning and the reason for these four words in this story. If I can only. If we could only believe that a little bit of God could go a long way, we might free ourselves to see more of God, to experience more of God, and to live more complete, healthy, and carefree lives. That is one of the main points or lessons of this biblical story. But there are two more important points or teachings that I quickly want to mention 
and I highlight, it will be quickly. Or so I say. <laughs> the main point of the story and of my sermon, as I have said, is that the most minuscule encounter or contact with God can produce great results. Or in other words, like my title says, that a little bit of God can go a long way. But another thing that the story of Veronica teaches us is that we don't need to let life's difficult circumstances define us. We need not let our imperfections, our illnesses, our physical limitations, our psychological scars, our limited economic means define who we are and what we can accomplish. Veronica didn't allow herself to think that her circumstances could stop her. And neither should we. And a third important lesson we can learn from Veronica's story is that no matter how hopeless a situation may seem, we should never lose our hope. We should live life believing that God's grace that God's healing activity and therefore that our well-being and miraculous fulfillment is just a touch away. Just a touch away. Just a touch away. So what is your life challenge? What is your malady? What is your condition? What is your hemorrhage? What is your need, in other words? And do you know that Jesus' mantle is there waiting for you to touch it? Do you know that God's gracious and healing presence is here right now just waiting for you to reach out and touch it? Do you have the faith that a simple touch of Jesus' mantle can make you well? Do you have, in other words, Veronica's faith? Remember her words. If only, if only, if only, I want you to repeat now with me, if only, one more time, if only, and one last time, if only I can touch his cloak, I will be made well. God's cloak is here waiting for you to touch it. God's cloak is right there waiting for you to touch it. Go ahead. Hurry up. Touch it. Touch it. If you can only touch it, you will be made well. Now I want the musicians to come and join me. And as they play in the background, I want you to think of these words. If you are in some sort of need, and if you believe that a simple touch of God and from God can do you well, I invite you to stand right there where you are. You, you don't need to come down here to the altar. If you want to come, you can. You're free to do so if you like. But right there where you are right now. Right there where you are. I believe that God's cloak is long enough where you can reach out and touch it. I am simply asking you to stand up in an act of faith. And to believe 
that all you need is to reach out and that you will be made well. And while the musicians play lightly in this background, I am going to ask Pastor Greg and Pastor Acevedo to come up and to take turns making an intercessory prayer, a prayer of intercession for our people today. And we will conclude this service in this way, by way of this prayer for healing, this prayer for deliverance, this prayer for guidance, this prayer for whatever you are in need of this morning, and for God's touch. And as they pray, I want you to remember these words. A little bit of God can go a long way. 